Why did I want to become a priest? What called me to this vocation? Which moments during my seminary formation assured me that I was on the right path? Am I happy with my decision? When I attended a priestly ordination for the first time, I thought seriously of becoming a priest. It was a feeling that came over me at the anointing of the priest's hands. It did not remain just a feeling for long. I began testing my vocation over the years. I first completed my studies to become an architect, which I also felt called to. But the calling to become a priest would not let me go. I wanted to live a full life, free, from purely material concerns. I came to realize my God-given talent for working with young people. That is the talent which I sought to develop. I became dedicated to the idea of caring for children and young people, as sharing their joys, fears and worries in order to give these youngsters much needed moral support in their lives. The priest doesn't live in his own little world. His very purpose is to live among people and to serve them. That was my goal and my deepest longing. Shortly before my graduation, I went on retreat for the first time in my life, spending several days in silence and prayer. A retreat is a special occasion for simple conversation with God in meditation to gain better knowledge of His will. On that retreat, I knew clearly that God was calling me to the priesthood. I also spoke with the retreat preacher who supported me in my desire for the priesthood and advised me to visit the seminary. During that visit, I was impressed by the atmosphere of silence, peace and recollection which reigned in the seminary. Moreover, I had the occasion to make new friends among the seminarians and with whom I could spend time in their daily activities. I have fond memories of the soccer games we played. At that moment, the die was cast. I decided to enter the seminary. In today's world, everything revolves around man. We see today's priests involved in secular projects, serving as theologians on a committee or as social workers. They are all devoted and committed to their cause. But they have forgotten the most important point. The priest is a man of God. And all these social programs, for all the good they might do, cannot replace the priesthood. And we are being cheated if the faith only brings about mutual understanding and good feelings about ourselves. That is worldly theology. That is feel-good theology. If that was all the priesthood was about, I wouldn't pursue it. I would have gotten married and served as a pastoral assistant. But there is much more to priesthood than this. It aims much higher. The priest's life is defined by the most intimate, personal union with God. He speaks with God in the name of the Church, and that is the prayer of the breviary, which he prays every day. It belongs essentially to his vocation and is among his basic duties. Through this prayer, the priest himself is filled with the Holy Ghost, or as St. Augustine puts it, in thee there must burn the fire which thou wouldst enkindle in others. And from this total commitment flows the obligation to celibacy, the unmarried life of the priest. For this reason the priest plays a central role, especially among the youth. As another Christ, he seeks to enkindle the fire of the Holy Ghost in the hearts of the youth. Therefore his presence in schools goes far beyond the task of a religion teacher. Through the priest's life and example, he shows the children the ideal of the imitation of Christ. A true priest 
makes it clear to the young people that Christ was much more than a charismatic social reformer. In order to transform souls through God's sanctifying influence, the priest uses extraordinary means, the sacraments. These are sources of grace and holiness instituted by Christ himself. And the goal of the priest's work is the administration of the sacraments. The ceremony of baptism is not just a time for a family to rejoice over the birth of a new child. At the moment when the priest pronounces the words of baptism and pours water over the head, he gives the child the gift of sanctifying grace, making him a child of God. In the sacrament of matrimony, he brings the couple's marriage vows before God and calls down God's blessings upon the new family. Thus the priest is the one who gives sanctifying grace. He forms the faithful through the mystery of the sacraments and leads them into closer union with the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The knowledge of God with the deepening of our faith should bring us one step closer to Him. This is all about building up a life-giving contract with God. This is the goal of my priestly office as a mediator. In order to build this relationship between God and man, in order to work effectively as mediator and intercessor, the priest should preach the truths of the faith in his sermons, relying always on God's revelation. Heaven, after all, is the final goal of our earthly life, transformed and exalted by God's grace. The priest teaches men the way to heaven and accompanies them, guiding them towards this eternal goal. If man strays from the path to heaven by sinning, if he turns his back on his God and Savior, Christ, through the priest's hands, sends his mercy down to the man wounded by sin and cleanses the man's soul from all his sins in the sacrament of penance. Here the priest applies the purifying and sanctifying power of Christ effectively to the soul of the sinner, who is now delivered and can continue his journey with joy and renewed courage. What gives the priest this ability? Where does he get this redeeming power which he pours out on the faithful in abundance? He gets it from the daily offering of the holy sacrifice of the Mass, in which he truly makes present again the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Every morning the priest holds in his consecrated hands the sacred body and the precious blood of Jesus Christ. This is the source of all the graces which the priest showers down on the faithful through the sacraments. Our Lord's infinite love is not yet satisfied when He comes down on the altar in the hands of the priest, when He dwells in our tabernacles for us to visit Him and adore Him there. Our Lord is not satisfied with blessing us solemnly by His real presence in the Holy Eucharist. He yearns to come even closer to us. He wants to give Himself to us completely with His divinity and humanity, with His flesh and blood, with His body and soul. Thus he offers himself as food for our souls. It is a great joy for the priest to place the Savior on the tongues of the faithful. Through his priests, the Savior accompanies his children throughout their lives. And even in the final moments, when the soul leaves the body of the dying, the priest is there by his side. He purifies and strengthens the dying for their entry into eternity. Not only does the priest guide us on the road to heaven, he even opens for us the gate which leads to eternal happiness. Now I wanted to attain the ideal which attracted me so much. I wanted a solid Catholic formation which would enable me to serve and assist men in their different walks of life. But which moments in the seminary life showed me that I was on the right path? The important moments when I knew that I was in the right place occurred during the youth camps on summer vacation. Here I witnessed the good influence which a priest can have on the youth, how much he can help them by spending time with them and living out St. Paul's words, becoming all things to all men. In our seminary, 
In our seminary, I recognized for the first time that being a priest means, above all, loving the Holy Mass. Offering daily the Holy Sacrifice to the Heavenly Father, and this is precisely what modern seminaries nowadays view with an entirely different outlook. A Silesian priest once told me that the Church's future no longer depends on the priest, but rather on the faithful, on the laity. But that is a great misunderstanding of the Church's nature, for if there are no more priests, then there is no more Holy Mass. And if the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass no longer exists, then the Church has lost its meaning entirely, which is also the reason why we find the new Mass unsatisfactory due to its Protestant spirit. Coming to Zeitzkofen was not a difficult choice. I had known priests growing up, and I knew what they were like. They are usually calm, relatively educated, serious in matters of the faith, and they had a kind of goodness about them, not a sentimental kind of goodness, but a principled way of acting that I really admired. When they celebrated Mass or prayed their breviary, you could tell that the first place in their life was for God. And when I decided to become a priest myself, I knew I wanted to go where priests were formed like the ones I had known. I wanted to study Catholic theology, I wanted to wear a cassock, and I wanted to sing Gregorian chant. I wanted to learn St. Thomas's philosophy and theology, and I wanted to say the Mass in Latin in the traditional rite. And that's what I found here in Seitzkofen, in a very peaceful, harmonious environment. It's a pleasant place to be, even just on a human level. In my opinion, Seitzkofen is the ideal place to prepare intellectually and spiritually for life as a priest in today's world. Now I could impart to others the intimate love of Jesus Christ which had welled up within me. I noticed this not only during my summer apostolate, but also in my dealings with men overall which made clear to me that the priest can lead souls to God through an apostolate which is directed by prayer. Am I happy with my decision? In my year of apostolate spent in Africa, I saw firsthand how much the priest can help miserable and abandoned souls by means of the sacraments. And now, as a young priest, I already hear many confessions, and thus, have a direct influence on souls as another Christ. A sinner enters the confessional and comes out cleansed. Who would not be overjoyed in having the power to give such consolation to one's fellow man? Yes, I am happy. Through no merits of my own, I have become an instrument of salvation and now I am ready to be sent into the world. After studying in a diocesan seminary, I joined the Society of St. Pius X because it preserves the Catholic priesthood as it was always practiced in the Church. Unfortunately, this concept is not the basis for priestly formation in the modern seminaries. The formation there is loaded with modernism, a system of ideas which the Church has condemned explicitly. Modernism tends systematically to put the emphasis on man instead of God. This is apparent in all areas of priestly formation and in the priestly life. In the liturgy, in the Holy Mass, the priest is no longer presented as another Christ, who in his very person offers the sacrifice of the cross in an unbloody manner. Rather, he functions as the president of the assembly according to the Protestant idea. In theology, multiple errors are taught. Biblical inerrancy is denied. The Church is placed on the same level as other religions. The priest's role is diminished. With the relaxation of discipline, one of its primary objectives, namely the mortification of evil tendencies, is hardly ever practiced. In spirituality, silence and recollection disappear. 
In the care of souls, instead of drawing strength from an interior life, instead of relying on the power of God's grace, one relies on merely exterior activities. Thus, the priest's role is reduced to that of an organizer or a social worker. Therefore, whoever wants to become a mediator between God and man cannot condone this program which dilutes the faith and destroys the priest's identity. May he stay on the road which the church has always followed by his fidelity to her unchanging tradition. This tradition is a guarantee for the preservation of the faith, for the renewal of the church, and this is especially brought about by the renewal of the priesthood. I wanted for myself an authentic priestly formation, as I had no desire to be a religious social worker. Listen to this. The Archbishop of saint jose in France said in November 2013 that in his 20 years as a bishop, he had buried 120 priests, whereas he had ordained only one deacon to the priesthood. This tremendous decline didn't worry him. Since just this year, he has appointed several lay ministers in his diocese. In my diocesan seminary, they would have trained me to be a financial administrator for the modern church. The church must be rebuilt once again. For this, we need zealous apostles who restore all things in Christ. That is why I entered the Society of St. Pius X here. How are the candidates for the priesthood formed for this supernatural responsibility? The formation in the seminary begins with the so-called Year of Spirituality. Here we lay the foundation for the entire spiritual life of the future priest. His life revolves more and more around all the spiritual duties, which he will have later on. For instance, daily Mass, weekly confession, spiritual direction, daily recitation of the Rosary, reading of Scripture, spiritual reading, and of course also the daily chanting or recitation of the Divine Office. For all of these are obligations that will accompany him for the rest of his life. But he also becomes acquainted with the theoretical foundations of the spiritual life. With these in mind, he takes a course in ascetical and mystical theology and thus becomes more familiar with the path to God on which all the saints have traveled. And that is something entirely different from empty prayer formulas or simply feel-good religion. In liturgy class, we introduce him to the ceremonies of the Church's yearly cycle and of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And in Gregorian chant class, we present to him the history and theory behind Gregorian chant while training him to sing it properly. Furthermore, we give him a serious introduction to Holy Scripture and in the course known as Acts of the Magisterium, he becomes well acquainted with the most important documents of the popes and councils from the last 200 years, which address above all the problems of the modern world which are felt in the Church of today. On this point, it is impressive to notice the insistence with which the popes warned us against the very dangers which today are proposed to us as solutions and how clearly they foresaw the problems which we are fighting against today. A high point of the year of spirituality is the solemn ceremony of the taking of the cassock. After four months, the seminarian receives his cassock, and from then on he will bear give witness to our Lord Jesus Christ by his mere presence. In the second and third years of formation after the year of spirituality, we fill the seminarians' minds following the directives of the teaching of the papal magisterium with a healthy, balanced, tried and true philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas. And it is wonderful to observe the seminarians thinking more and more clearly how much their common sense opens up and develops through contact with this realistic, objective philosophy, how quickly they learn to think outside the box, how they develop the ability to make distinctions and to see the different sides of a question, 
ihre Fähigkeit zu einer differenzierten Erkenntnis sich entfaltet. In the first semester, a historical introduction to philosophy directs their gaze upon the world of ideas and their influence on history of different countries. Logic strengthens their intellect and trains them to work according to a method which is firmly rooted in reality. With cosmology and the philosophy of nature, with psychology, they acquire the knowledge of what things are. Living and non-living beings, but mainly human beings. With their immortal souls which direct them to the knowledge of the truth and the love of the good. In the third semester in metaphysics, the most basic truths are proven, which hold together the entire body of natural knowledge. And to complete their formation in philosophy, we teach them ethics, with extensive treatment of the basic principles which govern human actions on the natural level. Alongside the study of philosophy, the seminarians take a course in apologetics, where they receive a scientific demonstration of the credibility of dogmas. And, in the next year, with ecclesiology, we impress upon them the traditional teaching on the nature of the Roman Church. The sources for all this are primarily the Magisterium, namely the First Vatican Council, and papal encyclicals such as Satis Cognitum and Mystici Corporis. But we also study the great theologians like Cardinals Below and Franzeline and Fathers Garrigo Lagrange and Zappalena. The fact that the new ecclesiology with its modernist idea of the Church constitutes a novelty and a break with the tradition of the Church is clearly proven by the study of these sources. The two-year study of philosophy is completed by a three-year study of theology. During these years in dogmatic theology, we conduct an intensive exploration of the vast area of the Catholic faith, with its mysteries such as the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Redemption, Grace, the Holy Mass, and the Sacraments. For our guide, we have St. Thomas Aquinas, who for centuries has been recommended by the popes as teacher and master of theology and received the title of common doctor. And of course, there follows an in-depth analysis of opinions taught in modern theology. In moral theology, we cover first of all the foundations of Christian morality. Under the guidance of St. Thomas Aquinas, we developed a positive outlook on moral theology, far from any false casuistry or exaggerated focus on sin. A sound knowledge of moral theology is a prerequisite for the administration of the Holy Sacrament of Confession and for moral guidance. Incidentally, the development of modern technology and modern medicine poses new problems. To these problems, such as the use of artificial feeding tubes or the prolongation of life by machines, Catholic moral principles must have a ready answer. Of course, the academic study of Holy Scripture is continued. Holy Scripture has a decisive importance as a source of revelation and faith for theology as well as for the development of genuine spirituality. In our modern hectic age, the priest's intimate union with God makes him a solid rock amidst stormy seas. In pastoral theology, there follows then the practical introduction of our seminarians to the care of souls. 
This program includes rhetoric, homiletics, pastoral care of different groups and walks of life, and the teaching of the faith through catechism. As supplements to all this, we have guest lectures or seminars, such as special instructions by doctors on dealing with emotionally disturbed persons. Other seminars are devoted to the topics of leadership, organization, time management, or crisis management. Thus, our seminarians are well prepared for the pastoral needs of souls in our time. The study of canon law is likewise indispensable. Church law furnishes the church's social bodies with the proper guidelines. These guidelines are based on charity, grace, and the salvation of souls, which at the same time facilitates the orderly development of church life and the individual believer. The priest's every activity in the church is bound up with law, rights, and duties. Liturgy classes help to deepen the seminarian's knowledge of and love for the church's rites and ceremonies. These are not just empty rituals, but rather a genuine expression of the church's tender love for God and Christ, her spouse. In addition, lectures on church history are likewise continued. History is a great teacher, which holds many lessons precisely for our time and on how we must overcome the crisis in the church. Here in the seminary, we work towards giving our seminarians a complete and well-rounded formation. Doctrine, piety, liturgy, and discipline work together to complete each other. In our amply furnished library, our seminarians can convince themselves that we pass down to them merely what we ourselves have received. That means the teaching of the Church, handed down by the popes, the councils, and the great theologians. On Archbishop Lefebvre's tombstone we read, I have handed down to you what I have received. The goal of the young seminarian is not self-actualization, but rather inspired by faith to become a man of God, an instrument in the likeness of Christ. Doctrine and piety are therefore two pillars on which our formation rests, for these young men whom divine providence has confided to us. The seminary is on the one hand a monastery and on the other hand a university. Our formation rests on both of these columns, but these two pillars must be accompanied by the traditional liturgy. The Holy Mass, as a real sacrifice of adoration and praise of thanksgiving and propitiation and of petition. Without the traditional liturgy, priestly formation is doomed to failure. And what about the spirit of the Church? That is our primary goal. We seek to form men of God, hence men of the Church who are equipped for the spiritual combat which lies before them. The years of formation are accompanied by the individual stages leading up to the holy orders, which guide the seminarians step by step in their ascent to the altar of sacrifice. Supported by the cross of Christ, inebriated by the blood of the Redeemer, relying on Mary's status as the mediatrix of all graces, the young seminarian can look forward with confidence. 
as the Archbishop said so well in his spiritual journey. A priest enlightened by faith and filled with the virtues and gifts of the Spirit of Jesus can convert numerous souls to Jesus Christ, raise up vocations and transform a pagan society into a Christian society. That is the ideal which I had before my eyes. I wanted to be that kind of priest, simply Catholic. That means traditional. Therefore, a priest who has received the mission from God to save the souls of countless men. The salvation of souls is my highest goal as a priest. I can achieve this goal by declaring the good news of the Catholic faith to men, by giving them the sacraments. But the deepest way to reach this goal is by offering the holy sacrifice of the Mass, the source of all graces and the highest expression of adoration and praise, of propitiation, of thanksgiving and of petition. Priest for Eternity that is my present status. This grace filled me with great joy. For what could be more beautiful for a man than to work in Christ's vineyard, to baptize children, to reconcile penitent sinners to God, to give the bread of life as spiritual nourishment to the hungry, to give them the very body of Christ, to wrestle in prayer, to win many souls who are not prepared to cut their ties to the passing goods of this world and thus will not renounce sinful habits. I am ready to make reparation for the multiple offenses against God and His Holy Church. My life is now penetrated by holiness. The harvest is great, but the laborers are few. The Church needs traditional priests urgently, many traditional priests. It's your turn now to do something great with your life. Forty-five years after the founding of the SSPX, it comprises 600 priests, 200 seminarians, 380 religious workers working together with 30 religious communities. It is active in 70 countries, runs six international seminaries and over 100 schools. The SSPX is therefore a living branch of the Church. www.priestaseminar-hertz-jesu.de